Welcome everyone to Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and after the Battle of Chickamauga, George Thomas received great praise from all over the country and received command of the Army of the Cumberland while in Chattanooga. As the Union Army of the Cumberland retreated into Chattanooga, the Confederate Army of Tennessee occupied the heights surrounding the city, cutting it off from gaining much of its needed supplies. Confederate cavalry raids tightened the rebel grip around the Union troops, but the War Department was dispatching reinforcements to their aid. Troops from the Army of the Potomac under Joseph Hooker and troops from the Army of Tennessee under William Tecumseh Sherman were on their way to support their blue-clad brothers. Ulysses S. Grant was also made commander of all forces in the Western Theater, and Lincoln gave Grant the leeway to remove Rosecrans if he felt he needed to. Lincoln was now not concerned with Rosecrans's political importance since the election in Ohio had gone Lincoln's way, so when those instructions came to Grant, he wasted no time in replacing Rosecrans. The order arrived at Rosecrans's headquarters on October 19th, removing him from Army Command. Thomas would be his successor, and Old Path was called to headquarters and allowed to read the order himself. They both stayed up late, Rosecrans imparting all the information to Thomas that he would need as commander of the army. Rosecrans left the next morning, and Thomas took command of a besieged army. To supply the army, Rosecrans had contemplated opening up a supply line across Brown's Ferry in Moccasin Bend, but he had not acted on the plan. Thomas would. His engineer, William F. Smith, would make preparations, and with the help of Joseph Hooker, he would be able to push the Confederates away from the location and secure the river crossings. Grant would arrive on October 23rd, soaking wet from a hard rain. He would be briefed about the situation from Thomas and his staff, and once he heard about the opening of the supply line, he gave it his blessing. On October 27th, Union forces opened up the supply line. During the night, the Confederates launched a counterattack, but failed to dislodge the Union forces. During the fight, some mules became spooked at the sound of gunfire and ran into Confederate lines. The rebels, confusing the sound of mule hooves with that of horses, thought they were being attacked by cavalry, which sent them running for safety. The joke became that the mule brigade had saved the day, and some even joked that the mules should be given a brevet promotion to horses. Thomas even took part in this fun when a private came to Thomas to ask for him to write an order for the quartermaster to give him a quart of shelled corn. Thomas asked if the man had been given his ration the previous day. The soldier replied in the affirmative and explained, but last night I was on guard and getting very hungry I borrowed a quart of corn off a mule and promised to pay him back this morning. You see, General, I am up a stump, and the whole mule brigade will be kicking if I don't pay up. Thomas smiled, took in the situation, and wrote the soldier in order for an extra quart of corn. On October 27th, Thomas would learn that he had been promoted to Brigadier General in the regular army. His rank of Major General was only temporary until hostilities ended. In early November, Thomas and Grant had their first disagreement. Grant feared that Bragg would send troops to dislodge Ambrose Burnside who had captured Knoxville. So he wanted to attack Bragg's army in some fashion. Grant favored an attack on Missionary Ridge, but Thomas wanted to shell Lookout Mountain with heavy artillery and use Hooker's men to attack that location. When orders came from Grant to attack Missionary Ridge and then advance beyond it and cut the rail line to the south, Thomas and his chief engineer, William Smith, personally scouted the front and came to the conclusion that their troops had not recovered sufficiently from the siege nor had their horses and mules to pull artillery. Thomas proposed to wait until Sherman arrived before attacking. Grant begrudgingly relented, but came away from the situation seeing Thomas as slow-moving and too cautious. Their staffs did not get along either. Thomas formed a small military staff that took military etiquette seriously. Grant's staff had become accustomed to Grant's informal way of issuing orders, and when their respective staffs tried to communicate with one another, there was lots of miscommunication. Sherman arrived and the three men examined the terrain surrounding the city. Grant favored attacking as soon as possible and gave a projected date of November 22nd. Thomas was still concerned about his draft animal's condition and wanted to wait another month. Rains and bad roads delayed Sherman's troops, but Grant only blamed himself for the delays, not his friend. He did, however, blame Thomas for problems that old Pap couldn't control, like the still weak condition of his draft animals. Grant wrote that, I have never felt such restlessness before as I have at the fixed and immovable condition of the Army of the Cumberland. With Sherman's troops now within the confines of the Union defenses, Grant planned for two major assaults. On November 24th, General Hooker's command 
took Lookout Mountain. The next day, Sherman would attack the north end of Missionary Ridge, with Thomas putting pressure on the Confederate center. Thomas sent out skirmishers from his lines in order to test the Confederate rifle pits. At about 2 p.m., Union soldiers started coming out of their entrenchments, collecting their stacked arms, and adjusting their equipment. As the battle lines formed, the blue troops knew that the Leaf Bear Woods would provide them with a little shelter from the lead and iron raining down on them. But upon exiting the woods, each brigade either had 300 to 700 yards to march through the denuded valley before reaching the rebel lines, depending on their placement. Sherman's attack to the northeast was not going according to plan, and a message was sent from Sherman to Grant with three words on it, Where is Thomas? Grant ordered Thomas to launch his attack. Thomas told General Granger to move his men forward, but no attack came. Grant approached General Thomas Wood and asked why he hadn't moved out. He said he hadn't received orders to. He then went to Thomas and asked why he hadn't sent his men in. I don't know, Thomas replied. General Granger has been ordered to move forward. Grant found Granger at an artillery battery, personally aiming and firing the pieces. Granger had a habit of playing with cannons during battle, and up until this point, it had been viewed as a harmless idiosyncrasy but this time it had delayed the movement of an entire army. Grant approached Granger and said, if you will leave that battery to its captain and take command of your corps, it will be better for all of us. Grant had ordered Thomas's men at the sound of six guns fired in rapid succession from Fort Wood to assault and take the rifle pits and halt. However, his orders were horribly misunderstood by many commanders wondering what to do after they halted at the rifle pits. When those six guns belched forth their signal for Thomas's men to advance, 23,000 Union troops stepped off, aimed at Missionary Ridge. When many of the first-line Confederate troops began to run away from the approaching Federals, Thomas's troops did not stop at their entrenchments and continued after them. Grant became angry that the troops did not do as ordered and turned to Thomas and demanded to know who ordered those men up that ridge. Thomas replied, I don't know. I did not. Grant then turned his attention to Granger and asked, Did you order them up? No, Granger replied. When those fellows get started, all hell can't stop them. Thomas's army captured Missionary Ridge, and he and Grant rode to the top to observe the captured location. Thomas remembered, I fell among some of our old soldiers who always took liberties with me, who commenced talking and giving their views of the victory. When I attempted to compliment them for their gallant manner in which they had made the assault, one man very coolly replied, Why, General, we know that you've been training us for this race for the last three weeks. After a failed pursuit of Bragg's army, Grant wanted to relieve General Burnside at Knoxville, so he issued orders to Granger to head in that direction on November 27th. When he returned to Chattanooga on November 28th, he found Granger still there. Granger hadn't received the order until late on the 27th, and he didn't want to get a late start and resolved to move the next day. Grant took this as Thomas and his subordinates being slow and timid and sent Sherman instead. As one of Thomas's biographers put it, in Grant's eyes, Thomas compared poorly with Sherman, who was always willing to take risks and eager to go on the offensive. Even though Sherman had failed to achieve his goals throughout the Chattanooga campaign, Grant knew that Sherman had tried his best to carry out his orders, move quickly, and stay on the offensive. Grant had no such confidence in Thomas. Despite the problems between the two commanders, Thomas would not have to deal with Grant for long. Grant would be heading east, while Thomas stayed in the west.